The Integer Group uh, belongs to Omnicom and partners with TBWA around the various markets. Um, uh, and last year, Integer within Omnicom globally grew 48% as an agency group. And that context is setting the platform for potentially a new way of marketing in the various markets. And I think we're starting to cause quite a stir in terms of the approach to the integrated marketing mix, driven by how people buy and less, and I know my advertising guys might, might think I'm being controversial here, but it is less about awards and more about accountable marketing. So you're going to hear a fundamentally different way and view from, from myself today. I'm an ex-SAB guy, I've worked in Africa and a number of the countries, and we'll talk a bit about route to market today, but I think about our first three to four years of expansion in, in, on the African continent. It was about basic route to market, basic distribution, basic principles of selling right in the trade, setting up key channels. And I think that's the kind of sort of uh, uh, thinking that we want to distill today around this shopper marketing space of ours. So just from a, I, I often get asked to try and explain shopper marketing, what is the path to purchase, develop all these models. Uh, what we've learned over the last two to three years now is actually by developing all these complicated definitions and complicated models, We've actually confused businesses. And quite honestly, the key thing that we're finding is aligning organizations to speak to shoppers better. It's probably one of the most fundamental things. Now, traditional consumer marketing, I think you guys, you know, if, 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 if there's a clear uh, a sort of agreement in the room, how we understand consumers and how we understand shopping behavior is fundamentally different. And I think that is what's causing the kind of difficult relationships, the collaboration that's needed in organizations to develop a holistic through the line uh, strategy. So I'm hoping to share some of that thinking today in terms of some of the questions that we should be asking in our organizations to align to how people buy. Shopper marketing growing rapidly around the world. All the FMCG businesses starting to invest in this space. We're seeing dramatic shifts on budgets into shopper retail marketing and digital. And I think the advertising guys are obviously in a space now where they're starting to work on those models and say, how do we bring all of that together? Because if we create a whole new set of silos in the digital and shopper space, we're not going to make this thing work. And I think that's the key challenge. We need to acknowledge that a lot more money is being spent now to drive purchase behavior that doesn't say building brand awareness and brand affinity is unimportant. Your objectives might be slightly different. And I, my experience from the, from the African market is very much getting those basics in place from a route to market perspective and understanding how people buy is actually the most critical thing in your first growth fed of any of the big, big brands. So lots of insights that we can share from an SAB perspective if you guys are interested. But the bottom line is shopper marketing is becoming a villain and the hero of FMCG businesses and including banks, etc., etc. It is... And I call it the villain because it's hugely misunderstood. But it's also the hero when it comes right, it drives fundamental change within an organization from a value and a sales perspective. But the world is polarized. Some people have an understanding of it and some have a very different view on it. And I'm, I want to try and articulate those two different places. But as I said to you, there's a massive divide. Some people see shopper marketing as tactical retail solutions that fit under an advertising campaign. That's what 80, 90% of the world thinks shopper marketing is. It's a brief taking part silo that comes from the advertising big idea and executes posters and wobblers in the trade. That's how people think about shopper marketing. Um, that the store and category is the key area of influence. That is not shopper marketing. Shopper marketing actually is a strategic process that binds shoppers and consumers around retailer, channel, and brand. And understanding that it's a process in organizations has been very difficult for most companies around the world. The only guys that are starting to get it right are the likes of the Unilevers, PNGs, a couple of the beverage guys. But when they get it right, if you look at the Knorr global strategy now, Knorr are spending nothing else around the world other than on their What's for Dinner program. And What's for Dinner was developed as a shopper marketing solution within retail. Last year, Knorr in this country 
Unilever as a brand spent 125 million on a single campaign in two retailers last year. So it's massive investment when it comes together. The best practice that they took out of this region, they now gone into a global shopper marketing camp. P&G have developed a brand called Have You Tried This? So they've got all their individual brand strategies. They've created a new brand above it called Simply Have You Tried It? And what they're trying to do is group brands together in the trade and actually develop this concept of them always being new. It's probably one of their biggest shopper marketing programs. And last year they announced that they're spending 1.5 billion rand on it globally. I mean, it's massive investments in this space. So once you start understanding this whole collaborative kind of mindset, rather than a short-term tactical stuff, there's a lot of traction that gets done in your markets. What I'll say from an Africa perspective and a route to market perspective, I know Graham and I have chatted about this extensively. If you took a typical route to market model, this is an SAB example of 12 steps that they do every time they hit a market within Africa. Number one, consumer insights. Two, brand strategies. Three, channel marketing, shopper marketing, planning, playbooks, etc., etc. Most of the time, they're spending all of their work and their investment in these kind of areas. Channel development, marketing playbook development, uh, s uh, execution guides for the guys in the trade. We've just received a request now from, I think it was Revlon, to look at launching Mac in Nigeria. That came through one of our global partners. I mean, fundamentally, Mac around the world is sold in shopping centers, and we've got two. So how are we going to build Mac in Nigeria is the key question. And the, the traditional approach of doing it needs to be completely broken up. We've got to look at new route to market models to actually develop that thing in the trade. What are the barriers to purchase? What are the drivers to purchase? Perhaps even exploring a brand ambassador kind of model where people actually sell Mac as individual retailers themselves. Some of the best retail shopper marketing work is done in countries like Nigeria, Kenya, China, India, because it's a true understanding of how people buy things. And I think that's the exciting space is actually, and it's what the Revlons are looking at. United Biscuits contacted us two weeks ago. They are the biggest biscuit business in the UK. They want to grow in Nigeria and Kenya. They don't know where to start. They own McVitie's biscuits, all sorts of range of biscuits. They want to see us next week to say, what is our strategy for Kenya? What is our strategy for Nigeria? And these are the kind of models that we want to put together for the guys. So I think there's huge opportunity coming from around the world and I think we've got to just prioritize in terms of what the key issues are and where we're going to go with these businesses. We typically, what we've been doing around the market and it's actually been working quite extensively now for Integer in South Africa and we're doing it now globally, is we develop these things called playbooks for people and it's really a, just a guidebook on how to execute in the trade um, and it's based on consumer insights, shopper insights, brand insights and how you execute in tailored ways across the different retail channels, if you have retail channels. We've done things like this for food companies, and we've even done it for the bank. So we're extending now throughout Africa. Standard Bank have asked us, I mean, we've done a style guide now for Africa, but Standard Bank are looking at how their, retail, their branches work from a retail perspective now. It's quite an interesting space because the guys want to move away from seeing themselves as just bankers and far more of guys on how we need to engage our consumers and our shoppers in our retail branches. Now, I'll give you an example of the power of retail um, in this country, and you guys might know the numbers, but I mean, a, a typical pick and pay or a spa has 50 million transactions per month in the stores. That is bigger than any other media touch point in this country. 50 million transactions. That's not people that's walked through the store, that's actually people that have paid for something. So that's with my kids, with my family, etc., etc. It's a powerful place to build brands, and you've got the products close to you. I think that's the challenge, is how we actually um, do this in a very simple way. The problem is there are very, very uh, few guys that are actually doing it, and a lot of guys overcomplicating this thing. So I think, I always use the story, I mean, you, a lot of people think shopper marketing is new. It's not new. The first store ever in the world that ex actually sold something beyond a guy behind the counter handing it to you was a store called Piggly Wiggly in 1916. That's when shopper marketing started because Piggly Wiggly said, 
we're going to relay our store so that people can select things themselves. And then we have to be smart on how we do it. So if you go to Wikipedia and you look at the strategy, the 12 point strategy for Piggly Wiggly in 1916, it's exactly the same as what Tesco pick and pay spa strategy is today. It hasn't changed in a hundred years. <coughs> so it's an interesting space. If people overhype this to you and tell you this is the new big thing, it's not. It's actually just a far, far more science being applied to it now, far more thinking being applied to it. And I think that's really where the businesses are starting to head from the investment perspective. So we did an analysis, 72% per of businesses that didn't create individual shopper marketing silos, but saw it as a cross-functional strategy, were 50% more profitable and 50, uh, sold up to 50% by category more sales than businesses that didn't see it as a cross-functional strategy. The big one for me is funding, and I know this is probably the most sensitive area. If your marketing directors and brand managers are not involved in shopper marketing, you're wasting your time. All around the world, shopper marketing has been the job of like the sales guys and the category guys. It's the wrong thing to do. They have no understanding of how consumers and shoppers think. And so the, where we're getting real traction in this market is engaging those marketing teams to start making those decisions on what's great. And it's not an either or thing. And I think that's what we need to get out of our minds. It's a stage of the brand's development phase. And what's relevant now might not be relevant next week. We might need to build brand affinity. New launch, new brand, something exciting. It's about just weighing up those objectives. So quite an important thing that we don't see this as a whole new thing we have to think about. It's more of an integrator. Um, the bottom line is, you know, brands today, and especially the food, FMCG kind of beverage brands around the world, you're seeing massive shifts now. I mean, I, as I said to you, I worked at SAB. We used to, about 10 years ago, had about a 50-50% split in above the line and below the line uh, uh, advertising money. In Africa now, SAB's investment is 90-10 in, in trade investments, shopper marketing, trade marketing, and 10% above the line. So it gives you sort of an understanding of where that business has shifted or even didn't shift. It just started like that. In Africa, it's been a highly successful strategy to develop a stronghold on the continent. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of good traction that the guys are getting out of it. I think the key thing is, will businesses carry on doing this little cute little shopper stuff and will keep on putting out posters and, and wobblers? Or will we start... And I think you guys, have, Yellow would have spoken about it, but will we start researching, planning, measuring, and getting a lot more clever on how we execute in the trade? We've, we've actually suggested that if, if you, we can guarantee a client 15 to 20% savings in their business by actually just finding out what the key driver and purchase lever is and spending money there on nothing else. But to find that single-minded insight is quite hard. And I think that's the key challenge, is how do we learn to ask the right questions in the organizations? So quite an interesting phase that we're going through. So in order to inspire a journey, and there's only three things I want to touch on here. One is we have to integrate consumer demand and shopper conversion. It is, cannot exist today where we are running these things as, as separate business units and business silos. Number two, we have to drive a collaborative culture in our organization. And unfortunately, the only way you can be successful in this space is if you implement change. Because we cannot approach the whole cookie cutter kind of mentality and how we built brands before. And the other thing is I want to leave behind some questions that we typically help the businesses ask to start thinking differently about uh, uh, marketing. So the first thing about integrating consumer demand, the mistake that everyone's making is creating another silo. So you get your digital above the line, TV, etc., etc. This is creating huge complexity in companies, and it has to stop. This is a hard enough as it is to align in organization, and you mean each one of these things are a division where everyone's fighting for their own budget pools, etc. So the first thing I tell everyone is, please, dear God, don't add another silo. We're seeing it in some of our food businesses here. They're hiring shopper marketing managers. I mean, you guys deal with these kind of businesses. You understand how they're structured. You know, a shopper marketing manager, a brand manager, a key accounts manager, a sales manager, and no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> so what we're suggesting is bring it together, guys, into an integrated place 
that is not another silo, but it is just something that is stemmed around great ideas. Great ideas that build consumer demand and also drive uh, shopper conversion. And I think if we as an industry and we as a business can get this right, we're in a healthy space. And there's always challenges. We have our individual silos, we have our individual profit centers, but getting that glue around this area makes us channel and media agnostic. And I, I see it, the only time we actually collaborate very well in this organization, for instance, is when there's a great idea on the table. It's almost like the glue. A idea that builds the brand, but also understands that we've got to sell more stuff. A lot of our clients are saying to us, great on those 17 luries you won, but how much doom did I sell? That's what they're asking us. And I think if we go as a business and we approach it in this way, we're actually going to be a far stronger business. And very few agencies are getting this collaborative thinking right. I have to say that to do that and that are polar opposites. They are completely different mindsets. And you have to first just know that a consumer and shopper is different. You'd be surprised how many people don't. The drivers of behavior here are fundamentally different to drivers of behavior here. And I think what we need is an appreciation and a respect that these are very different. A lot of guys, and this is a, a new space in terms of understanding why we buy, very few people truly understand it. And if you're ever doing shopper research, talk to me about it because I'll bomb 90% of the stuff you're doing. Shopper can't tell you what they're doing, they don't know. 86% of shopping is done subconsciously. They actually can't tell you. And if they do tell you, they're going to tell you that they only use Pantene and they drink premium beer. <laughs> and in, the show, in their homes is Colgate and uh, uh, So that's the truth of the disconnect. The only way you understand shoppers is to observe and measure actual real transactions. And we've proven now that shopper research that is behind a glass window asking questions versus how people actually buy is sometimes completely different. So, new space, difficult to, to handle. If you can crack this great idea that extends throughout the, 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 the line, it's irrelevant of who's doing what, whether it's web, retail, consumer, shopper, those are just channels that we're gonna access people in the right way. And so, the, you know, I think it's a critical thing, and the, the objective really is it's just marketing driven by deep insights. And probably not, and I know my advertising guys will kill me, but maybe not the award. <laughs> Brand USP, purchase barrier, category driver, consumption behavior. Ask those four questions. If you don't know them, don't worry. Use your gut, use your intellect, use your experience, but ask it in the right way. You don't necessarily need to go and do a million rands worth of research. Some of the best insights are actually from people that are just close to the brand. There was a simple project here, I think the group did so well on, was uh, 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 Enterprise is a, is a, I don't know if that example's ever been, the Enterprise cap example. But I mean, you, you guys know Poloni, uh, it's made by Tiger Brands here in this business. It's your, your normal sort of tube of Poloni. 20% of that Poloni, when that plastic paper is, is crunching up in your fridge, 20% gets old and they throw it away declining sales because that was the key barrier to purchase. People were sick and tired of that poloni going old. So the idea here was a simple plastic cap that when you bought your poloni from Enterprise, you got this red cap. So every time you cut the poloni, you just put the cap on back in your fridge. The promos that had been run here for the last two years, I think the best growth was about six and a half, seven percent through a particular channel, which is pick and pay. And for that six week period with that cap, it was 46 percent growth in pick and pay. So if you hit this little sweet spot around a shopper insight, what the retailer needs and what the brand actually needs, you get big sales. And I think that's a key kind of thing to try and get right. This is extremely hard to do. You've got to peel back some big onions to find a brand USP. And working out whether it's an emotional lever or it's an intrinsic rational lever is a hard thing to do. So all four of these are very difficult to do. What are my barriers to purchase? What's stopping me buy stuff? It's extremely hard to do. 
And it's almost like if you could focus on nothing other than these four kind of areas, you're actually going to get far closer to that little circle of a great idea. The other thing I want to say is that great shopper marketing is not just retail. And I'll repeat this over and over again. It's pre-tail. It's what people do before retail. One of the biggest drivers of, of, of uh, revenue now in the integer group is a thing called digital. And it's the integration of digital and retail in this stage. You know, the growth in online shopping, the growth in social media sharing of products, it's a massive influencer. In this country, they're predicting about a 9% of total shopping will be done online. That's the average around the world. So one thing I want to say is like, Online's not ever going to take over how people shop. But 56% of, of, of purchases in the grocery stores is influenced by digital. And I think if you can align those at this stage, it's important. And we always say to the guys, shopper marketing is not about just selling something to someone. So you've made the purchase. Most guys stop. The best shopper marketing has actually come from when people use the brand. And actually that experience that they're having post-purchase, the best, uh, the Poloni example is, is one of them. I don't want to buy any more Poloni because it's going old. So I actually just leave and I go and find other brands. If you can get here, habit, habitual purchase, you're actually going to drive volumes. They say in, in retail, there's, a, there's a, um, a sort of a number. They said if you could... You know, we do all these promos. I hate promotions. I think they're a complete <laughs> waste of money. <laughs> and we do all these things and we, we bump sales up. I mean, what promotions business. That's what Integer does. And I'm saying it's a load of crap. <laughs> it's because we bump up sales periodically and then do nothing about it. We're not working on flat curves. We're not working on stuff that's going to drive regular purchase. We're just looking for short-term spikes. It's a dangerous place, guys. Because eventually you're going to lose, lose sight of what the end goal is here. So be very careful that you're not driving a, uh, a flat curve structure. And I know that sounds brutal, but we are saying to clients, stop doing that promo. It takes revenue out of our, our mix, but we're building credibility through it because there are ways to actually drive better performance. So and the, the, one other thing I want to make about this is we spoke about a big idea, and I think... One of my personal frustrations is a lot of creative advertising is about taking a single-minded message and replicating it on every single touch point in the exact same way. If you apply thinking, and this is a continuum that we typically use, my mindset as a consumer or a shopper, when I'm not shopping, is fundamentally different to when I am shopping. And this Transition from what you say here to what you say here is something that very few agencies are getting right. Because there's a discomfort on not carrying through the same look and feel, the same word. And I must tell you that if you're playing in an emotional brand space, and the disconnect and where I think a lot of the challenges come, so we need to share that with you, is that True shopper marketers will say that, that that brand emotive message that you're trying to get through on a 30 second TV ad is not what you're going to do in an aisle in a store in two seconds. So talk to me what's going to drive the purchase while still supporting the overall brand idea. And that's very hard to do. So I want to put that out there. If you get this right, I think you're in a good space. So you know you're cracking it when... You've got deep understanding of what, why, and how people buy. I want to say this is that, and this is the fundamental difference between consumer marketing, shopper marketing. Consumer marketing segments huge groups of consumers into eight groups that all have a nice picture and a demographic and they look great and, and we go and market to them. Shopper marketing says we actually don't give a shit what you look like. We don't care who you are how you look, how much you earn. We care about what is the common behavior in that category. So we could have multiple demographics. I always show this one slide, but there was a demographic. You know, we, a demographics is a swear word in shopper marketing. It really is a swear <laughs> word. And we use this one thing where uh, you just see the demographic description. They're both middle-aged men, 
from the UK. They both earn a certain amount. They both got the same amount of children. They both live in the same area. And one of them's Prince Charles and the other one's Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the greatest thing in terms of just knocking the, the, this concept of trying to market to homogenous segments. Now, it's a hugely controversial thing, but behavior is the key here. So if you know how people buy beer or how people buy hair care, irrelevant of their demo, you're going to sell a lot more. Interesting dynamic. Makes people very uncomfortable. They want to put things in six segments. Tesco last year segmented their, their shopper base with the club card. You know the points card that they've got. It's a loyalty program. They sent out last year 1.7 million individual communications. 1.7 million different versions on how you buy. That's the world of shopper marketing. So when I get something, it's relevant. Quite a key thing to get right. Um, driving a collaborative culture. I, I, I must be honest that using this tool and trying to hit the sweet spot between what the brand needs, what retailers need, and what uh, uh, shoppers and consumers need is probably the most simplest, easiest thing to do. Ask those questions all the time. Is this good for my channel partner? Do I understand who my channel partner is? Firstly, is this good for my shopper? And is it good for brand? And it's not about focusing on either one. It's about just hitting sweet spots. And I, I, I guarantee you guys, when you find activities that end up here, they always deliver uh, a volume growth. Simple, simple tool. That tool is being adopted by many of our clients as their own internal tools. CEOs, marketing directors, they keep on asking those questions. When we develop these playbooks, we put this little triangle in the corner here and we just do a little tick sheet. Is it doing this? Is it doing this? Is it doing this? If it's not, bomb it. Quite a, quite a challenging thing to do, but it is about doing what's right and not what you feel is, is going to look cool. Learning to ask the right questions. Most businesses say, how can I make shoppers loyal to my brand? How can I get more information about my key drivers? You should be asking, am I focusing on the efforts of my shoppers that matter most? This forces you to ask that question. Do you actually know who matters most? Do you know what the purchase behavior and key driver is? Do we understand how people buy Mac in Nigeria? Is it just buying it from London in, in Knightsbridge? Or is there a way of actually really understanding that purchase behavior. If we don't know, can we create a way? Most people think that this is not an innovative space. I tell you now, it's probably one of the most innovative areas in the market. You go and tell me that a Hawken Espaza on a taxi rank in Africa is not innovative in the way she's displaying her goods and the way she's presenting, and she's got 20 competitors left, right, and center of her. You tell me that's not innovative marketing. Very, very, very smart stuff. My favorite one is, is our market share growing? So I sell beer, I look at my market share, I'm 90% market share, next year I'm 91%. Is it growing? SAB in this country, fundamental flaw, because they've been asking, is my market share growing? And what happens is you only think beer and you think nothing else. What you should be asking is, is our share of wallet growing? We should be analyzing cell phone spend, food spend, etc etc analyzing occasions to see if we can get beer into more places it's a fundamental shift in your mind um, how can we beat the competition it's so externally focused you forget that actually you want to win with the people that matter most so it's a fundamental shift in how you manage your business um, how much did we sell last week what's our cost per thousand they're all the same questions all our, our companies ask we actually don't care what we want to know is who bought what we were selling last week did we engage shoppers effectively? What's a customer ROI? Can we put this promotion in 500 stores or can we send it to 500,000 shoppers? That's a Tesco model. No one's thinking in that way. What do we cut from our lists or should we be selling what actually matters most to a total basket on our shop? Very, very different. And in summary, really from a retailer perspective, you know, collaboration is probably one of the biggest areas of of where this is going to happen. So both collaboration with your partners and collaboration internally. And I think we need to be simply asking this stuff that we're doing, these promos that we're doing, how will it benefit the experience, the shopping experience 
of our mutual shoppers. So you want to hit the sweet spot. You want a brand manager and the retailer all to understand who your shopper is. Just by asking that one question, you're going to unpick layers in those organizations where you'll see total disconnect. Quite an interesting process. And how are we going to grow total category and not just our brand? If you're thinking broader than brands and you're thinking beyond category, you're actually going to win a lot of favor with, with partners out there because the challenge now today is to move away from single-minded clutter in these environments. And if you can actually put together strategies that are driving entire businesses for it, you're in a great space. So I know it's a lot to, to go through and I've sort of gone on um, uh, quite quickly on it, but the picture of success for us is you need to drive consumption and not purchase. Many people think that shopper marketing is just about getting something into the basket. You want consumption. I'll give you an example. In this country, we've got a brand called All Gold. It's the Heinz biggest tomato sauce in, in, in the country. The fundamental issue with all gold in a group like pick and pay, all gold tomato sauce is in every single basket it can be in. You physically can't put another bottle of all gold into a, a pick and pay basket. It's maxed out. It's one of the highest in any other business. The one issue with all gold is to drive consumption, not frequency of purchase. Now, if you know that, that fundamentally will drive your strategy for all gold to give me ideas on how to use it more. Because we can't put more all gold into pantries. We want to get all gold out of pantries. And I always say to guys, that's what shopper marketing is about, is going beyond just putting stuff in a basket. So key kind of pointer, long-term shifts in loyalty. If you can shift shopping loyalty, get people to buy three or four things the same time over and over again, you're going to drive habit. In this country now, in a year, any person in the market, if you had to ask someone, how many different items do they buy from a supermarket? I don't know if you, I mean, you think about how you shop every day. How many items you think you would buy in a full year? Different items. I don't know what the numbers are. You guys got a view? I don't know. 215 is the average number of items that are in a basket. Average. And in that supermarket are 28 to 45,000 SKUs. The thing is, people are habitual. And to drive habitual purchase is the key challenge. Because if you do that, subconsciously, I'm just going to continue buying your stuff. You don't have to invest anymore. So little promotions that are not driving habitual purchase are a waste of money. Key insight. We have to support overall brand vision and goals. Any, anything else without doing that is just crazy. Collaborative relationships internally and externally. And for good, goodness sakes, just deliver measurable ROI. This doing things for the sake and hoping that our sales will come is crazy. So it is an accountable way of looking at our marketing mix. And really, guys, that's, a, I think, a, a brief overview of some of the challenges that we've faced in the whole shopper marketing space. If you guys are interested to follow this kind of space, I mean, my Twitter feed has permanently got ideas, best practice, retail, shopper marketing, etc., etc. So hook up with me if you want there. I don't talk shit on there about personal things. It's a pure, <laughs> it's a pure, um, uh, it's a pure business focus. I have to tell you that it's a great source of really great ideas and innovation. So if you guys are interested, just uh, just follow, and I'll happily engage further if you want. Can I ask you, online shopping? Yeah. I mean, there's no mention of that in any of this. Is it a, a similar approach? Is no, no. I, I, so in the pre-tail world, Integer's biggest driver now, and I'm deeply passionate about it next year, is um, developing our digital model. Now, our digital model has is, is got four quadrants. It's online, it's CRM and loyalty, yeah. it's um, uh, payment solutions, and behind it is social media. And we see all of those coming together in a single-minded focus around selling more stuff. So it's not isolated Facebook pages, et cetera, et cetera, that are not somehow linked to online shopping, linked to the retail stores, that the promotions are coming together in a seamless way. And this, there's, a, there's a terminology out there called omni-channel retailing. It's the biggest growth on where guys are going on. If you guys are interested, I'll, I'll email you a article from the CRO from Tesco on how they are pulling together digital and retail 
And it's basically their strategy going forward. I don't know if you know, but Tesco currently now do 10 billion pounds on products other than Kuh Baked Beans and Kellogg's. So their, their services channel. It's a massive, massive channel now. Um, online shopping is very hard in grocery, extremely hard. I mean, I worked at Pick and Pay for many years. We couldn't get that profitable for six, seven years. That's, you know, you don't want, you can send a book to someone or a video to someone, but how do you send them like some meat and tomatoes at the right time at their house is very difficult. <laughs> Amazon now launching their grocery food thing. Amazon is pre predicted by 2017 to be the second biggest retailer in the world. They're currently not even in the top 20, about $60 billion a year. Walmart are in the $300 billion a year. By 2017, Amazon will be $192 billion second to Walmart. That is scary, scary stuff. So bringing this world together is critical. I think that's where the, the real links between brand advertising and brand content come together in that brand plus conversion kind of thinking. So there's lots of examples on how I'm deeply passionate about it. Greg, yesterday we, the guys were talking quite a lot about um, sometimes the difficulty in having sort of strong strategic conversations with, with clients and clients sort of being very prescriptive about the kind of advertising that they're looking for and the, the types of solutions that they want and, and, and almost very much we've already decided and now we just need a brochure or this and that and the other thing. <coughs> I think a lot of this sort of thinking helps provoke the, the, the right kind of conversations with, with clients and sort of helps us to establish a stronger uh, sort of strategic value, I guess, in, the, in that relationship. Um, you know, it just it feels like you know, if, if we're able to have more of these kind of conversations which are directly sort of bottom line related, I think, um, as you mentioned, that uh, uh, you know, I think you know, it just adds so much more value to the, the kind of conversations we're having with clients. I mean, we're finding it. I mean, like we had a session with Clover last week and we literally met CEO of Clover and six of his board members. And they sat there in a room and we literally presented to them around the commercial benefit of this. And the discussion wasn't about advertising. It absolutely wasn't. And Johan's the CEO and he said, this is where we need to go. What we're finding, and I think it's important, you know, I don't know if that message came through, is for three years, we've been confusing the market with cute little models and little frameworks. The Oaks don't want to know that. They want to know, how are you going to help me sell more stuff and keep it simple? And we've actually distilled this discussion back to like a 20 minute engagement with senior level guys. And it's amazing what traction we're getting out of that. You literally put together a commercial model to say, let's go and play together for a three to four month period. Let's take a category or a set of brands and let's go and play in a particular retailer. And if it works for that, let's do another one. And that's why I love this whole, we've developed this concept called a playbook, which actually never ends because you can continually just keep on updating those things. And it's, I tell you what it's doing in these businesses is it's making them think differently because we, we have been facing for two years businesses that don't know what they don't know. And, yet, and so they default back to that cookie cutter kind of approach. And I think guys, when we bring that together with advertising and we bring it together with the marketing teams, so that it's not another silo in the organization, you get some really substantial value out of this. And I, you know, I think we've, we've seen some, some, some examples of that. Any other questions? Yeah. I do understand that you don't like promotion. So uh, my question is, is there any way we can link promotion, like promo and the show for marketing? So, so I need to qualify, 72% of all promotions, we did a test in UK and US, 72% of promotions that run in the total market was something like 380 billion rand uh, uh, was spent on it, 72 ineffective. They either made no sense from a, from a channel perspective, they didn't deliver any value for the retailer, they didn't develop any value for the, the shopper. I love promotions that hit the sweet spot. And that's why I love shopper marketing, because it's forcing us to ask questions around what is the brand need? What is the retailer need and what is the shopper need? We don't do enough of that. So it will either be a simple branded promotion uh, that just runs nationally and none of the retail channels actually give a damn because it's not specific to them. So all the guys are spending 30, 40, 50 million on these big national promos and they're ineffective. You get 
10,000 entries into them and you've got no substantial volume increases. What we're doing now is tailoring promos for specific retailers. So you tick the retailer box. And by goodness, if you can get it to actually tick a shopper box, you hit big volumes. I'm, t I'm talking five times volume increases. And so any promo growth under 8%, we don't even look at. We're looking at the 15 to 25%, and those are ones that work. So I need to qualify. I'm like, I love and hate them. <laughs> in, in, I used to work in a retailer in this country. On one weekend, I went around the store and counted the number of winner car promotions that were in the store, and there were 46. No. 46 winner car. Tesco did an analysis of hypermarkets. If you go into a Tesco hypermarket, so we sent researchers into a Tesco in the UK to count every single point of sale item that was up other than a shelf price label. And there were 18,200 pieces of labeling, advertising, marketing material, 18,000. Did an analysis on how much of it was actually walk past. 4,000 pieces were walked past because everyone thinks they shop the whole store. 25% of people actually don't even shop half the store and about 80% of people shop 70 or 60% of the store. So 4,000 of those 18,000 were walked past. Uh, 780 were looked at and 79 were bought. And you think to yourself, now come on Max, how do you, you know, we're doing these, we're doing these presentations for our clients with these beautiful through the line imagery on a PowerPoint presentation with great white backgrounds and they're saying, Phew, this is the best stuff. And you throw that into a real life environment and no one really cares. So how do you break through that? How do you disrupt people and drive habit is what you should be doing. And I promise you, you'll do one tenth of the promos you do, but you'll be recognized for bloody good work. It looks to be um, an extension of the qualified hatred for promotion. It seems to me applies to virtually every research activity to determine consumer needs to link it up to whatever you do. Insufficient research naturally will result in what you've explained. Yeah. And so emphasizes the need that we concentrate, drive to really what we can link up with our promotion, with our uh, whatever we, we want to do too. I, I want to ask you, not research is almost unaffordable. I think if we ask the right questions, we'll actually find insights that are so simple they're just lo looming in front of us. And we ignore that opportunity because we bog down with going through these hugely scripted kind of processes to go and ask consumers and shoppers how they think. We know that that is a slightly flawed model. The only real data that I've seen work for me is actual transactional data and how people buy. It's the most incredible thing. We did an analysis on Vienna sausages in one of the retail groups here. And 60% of those Vienna sausages, we looked at the total basket. Now, you ask moms, why do they buy Viennas? No, I must say, I'm agreeing with that yeah. statement. Do you know what we found in that basket, by the way? Was chocolates, little baby chocolates. 60% of the baskets had a little chomp in it which said that 60% of enterprise transactions in that retailer were for kids' parties. That single-minded insight is massive. So, remember the art of shopper marketing is make it easy for me to buy the way I already buy. And I promise you you'll get 20 to 30% increases. I just, sorry, just to, to build on that, I just think um, building on what Tim's saying is that we just have to be aware that shopper marketing is part of a holistic mm. marketing arsenal. Yes. And when Tim, I think when you're talking research, because um, you weren't here um, earlier, Craig, and we had Nicole speaking about brand relevance, and she was making the point as well that research doesn't have to be these big monumental Great. statistical Great. pieces. 
oftentimes you can just do dipstick research and it's not the research per se, it's the insight that you glean. Absolutely right. And I think Absolutely so you're both right. saying the same thing. Mm. And that research, I know Craig, I mean it's his job to bash um, <laughs> with bash uh, whatever, um, but it all My has to be to bash. It all fits together. Could have stirred some controversy. Yeah. Yeah. That's a board, well, man. Uh, just curious, uh, Craig. Yeah. Yeah. The work you want to do in Nigeria, informal markets, and um, sometimes um, chaotic. How are you going to approach understanding? You know, using some of the things you've talked about. We actually discussed that the other day. I mean, I'll give you an example on the the Mac opportunity. That Mac opportunity came to me through KPMG yeah. uh, US. And Graham and I were chatting, and, and the how we would see that kind of thing is we would come into the market and tap into your guys' expertise. Because we're so passionate about understanding route to market and channels, half of these businesses have no idea that there's two shopping centers there. They don't know what the strategy is for the four years. So to not connect with your offices would be the dumbest thing ever. We'd look like a bunch of idiots. But what we want to do is start connecting especially in three or four of the key markets because these opportunities are actually coming forward without us asking for them and it's like i think there's a time now for us to find a way to actually work together so that we can en enhance that sort of circle with great advertising great conversion and i you know i don't i don't know if that sort of answers your question but i wouldn't see it any other way yeah, I mean, yeah we, I mean, we talked about it, you know, something like the Mac example, when they've got a specific, uh, they've got a, sp a specific sort of shopping channel that doesn't seem to be appropriate in in, in Nigeria. So their 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 way of doing things, it, it just feels inappropriate. So we need to then come up with with solutions. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the things that Craig and I talked about was you know coming in, getting a a group of of uh, uh, you know senior thinkers together and yeah. people just really sort of creating you know put a, you know creating a mini disruption perhaps or or just thinking out of the box around what kinds of channels could we could we put in place what kinds of um, structures could we could we uh, dream up that might um, you know uh, create a, a different west african east african model that yeah. um, that would be relevant and, and as sort of Craig says that the nice thing about retail is you can you can carve off fairly small bits of, of it to test and try and, and experiment, and you can try different things at different places at different times, and uh, you know, and then sense test them, measure, and then come back and go, you know, Plan A worked fantastically, Plan B was absolute rubbish, and Plan C we're still in process of, and so you then kind of hone your your uh, your solutions, I think. Uh, are, are any of you are you any of you working on Coke in Nigeria? Um, no, no. So 1991, 92. Uh, we looked at Lagos and um, you know you, you can't get the trucks into the city you just couldn't get them in and out you know this whole model of perfect route to market and coming to deliver to a store doesn't exist so it was about 18 years ago and so we created um, post mix fountain machines on the edges of Lagos and they had the runners and the guys were putting coke into those little plastic uh, bags with a straw through it and they were selling it for cheap cheap and the Coke guys from Atlanta flew in and said, Phew, how can you sell Coke in a plastic bag? This is a mess. Stop it. And the guy said, check the volumes. They never said another word. <laughs> <laughs> never said another word. Those trucks were hitting the edges of Lagos. Like a, they couldn't bring enough soda to the edges of that thing. And then the, the youngsters would just run in. And they'd come back with empty. Um, uh, Kenya, there was a store on Kilimanjaro. And the guys, you know, the guys had the strategy of like have Coke available in every single corner of the world. And this little guy on the top of Kilimanjaro had a fridge and a little sign and cold Coke. And he used to come and fetch 30 cases at the base of the thing and go up on the donkey cart. And Coke Atlanta used to use that as their strategy. They say to all their bottlers, don't tell us the job can't be done. Tell us you can't do the job. Well, what do you answer to that? Because in Africa, we've actually developed some of the best route to market strategies I've ever seen in the world. It's an exciting place. I think for me that's the key. It's an exciting place. We were talking yesterday about pioneering and innovation. Derek touched on it again today. Hmm. And for me, this is a prime opportunity. Um, so it's an opportunity in each of your businesses. We'll be, you know, you'll be, we'll be cutting new territory altogether. I mean, have, 
you know, half the clients don't understand that 2% of Nigerian retail is formal retail, but that's the opportunity. How, as Graham said, how do we create a new model and how do we then replicate it in other parts of the continent? Well, yeah. we talk about, I mean, you know, we talk, uh, talked about uh, earlier today about finding creative, uh, creative ways to, um, to solve problems, you know, using our, our experience to find, find ways that are relevant for our particular environments, for our particular market. You know, and if you create a really innovative way uh, for somebody to shop something, you know, and you track back. You know that that does all the all the good things about moving products and making clients, um, uh, you know, value our in involvement and engagement and and, and the, the contribution we make. But if you if you if you take a further step back from that and go, you take that idea into a, into an international award, sh award show. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's exactly the kind of thing. That these guys are looking for local flavor ideas, and then you know, then you've you've solved the problem of uh, of you know the, the 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 twofold problem that we were sort of saying yesterday. Maybe it was was difficult to, to to bring together. You know, the practical, great ideas that work in a, in a in a particular a particular environment, plus you know, resonating you know across the, across the board for our own uh, publicity and, and, and fame and fortune. But I mean, like a Mac example. You take a hundred of the high-flying people in, in, in Lagos or in Nigeria and actually select them as distribution partners for Mac. Create your own route to market. Forget the fact that we haven't got retail stores. It's going to cost us money anyway. Yeah. And develop a, uh, a, a customer-owned route to market for one of the greatest brands. I promise you it'll be a global best practice. And it's based on old principles that we used in the Tupperware business. <laughs> it works. You know, that's... Not Africa for Africa. Nigerian solutions for Nigeria is what we need, and I promise you, we'll you know we'll be es escalating this this uh, this space. And all the brands are looking for, you know, United Biscuits. Are, they they looking for people to just help them with this thing. They're looking for those total end to end solutions. Mm. Great, great, exciting great. stuff. I, mean, I must must admit. Thank you very much. Craig. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.